Hello, and welcome to Unit 8 of STATS, all right? This is all going to be about confidence intervals, um, which is a way of sort of estimating, you know, population parameters. So it kind of continues on what we were doing last unit um, when we were learning about sampling distributions. And the one thing that was a little sort of disingenuous about the problems that we did last unit is that I always gave you a population parameter, all right? And I, the problem would say like, oh, the population value is this, or oh, the population value is that. And then we would do a whole bunch of calculations based on that population parameter. The problem is we don't usually actually have that information, all right? And that's what I mean by disingenuous. Like normally we don't know a population parameter. It's not just gonna be given to you. The whole point is that we're trying to find it. All right, so this is going to be kind of an extension of how do we find a population parameter? And since we can't ever be 100% sure of what it is exactly outside of talking to every single person in the population, um, how do we come up with a range of values for it? All right, how do we say like, okay, I don't know exactly what it is, but I think it's between this and this, um, and not just do it sort of off the cuff, but have a... Um, a systematic way of, of analyzing it that's that's kind of grounded in the mathematics that we've been doing. All right, so a couple important things to remember from chapter seven, which was all of like, you know, a day ago. Um, sampling distributions describe how the statistic varies in all possible samples of the population. Um, and then it's the central limit theorem states that as the sample size gets large, the sampling distribution of X bar is approximately normal, all right? So these are things that are gonna be important. In addition to this stuff that we kind of learned um, last unit, all right? So when we're talking about the sampling distribution of a proportion, our conditions are kind of random and independence, randomization and independence. 10%, um, again, is when you're sampling without replacement. You don't want your sample to be above 10% um, of the population. And then the success, success failure is 10 successes and 10 failures. And this is so that we can use a normal approximation. All right. But then we saw that the mean of the sampling distribution is equal to the population value. And the standard deviation of the sampling distribution is equal to PQ over N. And then we went through and did the same thing for means. Um, so again, randomization and dependence. 10% um, uh, again is sampling without replacement and large enough for our class we said basically that n has to be greater than or equal to 30 if the population is not normal all right if the population is normal then we don't really need to worry about the sample size as much right. and then I don't really like the way this one looks but basically this is the mean of y bar is equal to the population mean. All right, so that's kind of a review of what we just did. But all of these principles are still going to be important in this unit. Um, and we're still going to be using all of these formulas and, and taking advantage of all of this stuff. Now, the other things that we're going to need to kind of dredge out of our memory bank um, is the 68, 99.7 rule, which basically says that 68% of the observations are either one standard deviation above or one standard deviation below the mean. So this would be minus one standard deviation. This would be plus one standard deviation. And that's gonna represent 68% of the data. If we go out to two standard deviations, so minus two standard deviations or plus two standard deviations. That's gonna represent 95% of the data. And then last but not least, if we go out three standard deviations or go below three standard deviations, that's gonna be 99.7% of the data. Um, and we're going to use that when creating our intervals, right? And again, we're still going to be using normal CDF. We're still going to be using inverse norm. So a lot of that stuff is still going to be relevant 
as we create these intervals. Now, there is a lot of specific vocabulary tied up in this unit. So I want to start just by getting some of those down so that we have like a common language that we can use as going through when we're going through this. So first, we have the point estimator, which is a statistic. All right, and if I say statistic, that means it's coming from a sample. Um, that provides an estimate of the population parameter. It's also known as, or it's the best guess value. All right, so when we make these intervals for, you know, the population values probably between this and this, there's a center to that interval, and at the center is the point estimator. It's basically our best guess of, you know, what the true value might be, All right? Now, margin of error is basically, you know, how much space we're giving on either side of that estimator. So it's how close the estimator tends to be to the unknown parameter in repeated random sampling. All right, so this is basically like our error bars. Like how much are we, how much leeway are we giving ourselves above and below the point estimator? And then the confidence interval is basically these two things together. So it's the point estimator plus or minus a margin of error. So this is mainly what we're going to be creating this unit. We're going to be creating different confidence intervals. And when we create a confidence interval, we usually give it a confidence level. All right. So we're going to put down a, a definition for confidence level. I'm going to ship like, I'm going to show you a little demo to uh, explain what the definition is actually saying. So this is the overall success rate of the method for calculating the confidence interval. All right, so we're going to learn the method. All right, we're going to learn how to create a confidence interval. And then when we give it a confidence level, it's basically the success rate of our method. How often is our method going to contain the right value versus how often is our method going to miss um, the true value, right? Put another way, all right, so that is in C percent for confidence level. So in C percent of all possible samples, um, the method would yield an interval that captures the true parameter value. All right, so now let's take a look what I actually mean by that. All right, so what we have here is we have our population distribution. All right, so this is our population distribution. All the different values in the population, 
This is the sampling distribution, all right, which is when we take repeated samples of that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit this sample button, all right? And you don't need to know the exact process yet, but this is basically the value, the mean that was calculated from my sample, and then the interval that was created. All right, so we can see that the mean of the sample wasn't exactly the right value, which is not uncommon, but the interval that we've created does capture that right value. All right, now I'm going to do it again. All right, there's a new one. All right, that one's a lot closer. And again, the mean is inside of my interval. All right, I'm going to do another one, and another one, and another one, and another one, and so on and so forth. And you're seeing that for the most part, the mean is ending up inside of that interval. All right, now I'm going to do a whole bunch all at once. All right, now the one in red there is one that missed the mean. All right, so this was a sample that I took. I calculated a mean, I calculated an interval, but it missed. If I do this over and over and over and over again, sometimes you're gonna see a lot of red, sometimes you're not gonna see very many red, but what you're seeing down here is this percent hit, all right? That's the confidence level. It's saying that if you were to do this process over and over and over again, and again, we'll talk about the process in a little bit, we'll see what it involves, that 95% of the time, the process is going to give you an interval that contains the true mean, all right? Sometimes it's gonna be wrong, sometimes it's gonna miss, but if we do it over and over and over again, the confidence level is kind of the expected number of times you expect to get um, an interval that contains the value, all right? And that is doesn't matter what the sample size is. So like, let's say I put the sample size up to way bigger. So now I'm taking 250 people with my sample. So the sampling distribution got a lot more narrow, all right, because my results are going to be less variable because I'm taking a bigger sample. All right, so when I make it, you're going to see the intervals are smaller, but that percent hit is still hovering right around 95%. All right. And again, that's what we're referring to when we say the confidence level. It's when you follow this process, what percent of the time are you gonna get an interval that contains the true value? Now we actually get to pick the confidence level, all right? So we can change and choose different confidence levels. So if I want a 99% confidence level, I can do that. Um, but what you're gonna notice, it's a little hard to tell with this big sample size, but my interval gets a little larger. So to be 99% accurate, you have to have a larger interval. Um, if I go down and say, oh, I only need to make sure that I'm right, you know, 80% of the time, the interval can get even smaller um, because you're giving up some of that accuracy to have a smaller interval. So long story short, that's what it's referring to when we say confidence level. It's saying, all right, if you were to do this over and over and over again, what percent of the time would your interval contain the right value? Right. And then what we're going to be doing on the next page is actually seeing how we create these intervals. All right. Now, the last one we have here is critical value. All right. And the critical value is going to help um, sort of set up the interval and everything else we need. But it is the exact number of standard deviations, which is why it's Z. All right. Z scores are standard deviations. So it's the exact number of standard deviations to move away from the point estimator. Above and below, all right, because our interval is going to go up above the point estimator and below down below the point estimator, um, specified by the level of confidence. All 
right? So this is just some vocabulary that we're going to need um, as we create these intervals um, so that we can talk about it in a more kind of sophisticated way. All right, let's actually do one of these here. So mystery mean, right? What's going on here? So I have a number stored in my calculator. All right, I've stored it inside of X. I know what the number is. You don't know what the number is, all right? The number stored in X, you could think of as our population parameter, all right? So it is an unknown value that we want to estimate, all right? So how are we going to estimate that? Well, we're going to take a sample, and from that sample, we're going to calculate a value. All right, so I'm going to actually do that on the calculator. And this isn't something you need to know how to do. It's nothing you're going to be asked to reproduce, um, but it's just for the activity that we're doing right now. So I'm going to go to second to list. I'm going to go to math. I'm going to go to mean. And then I'm going to go to math probability, random number, x, comma, 20, comma, 16. All right, so what did I just type in there? All right, what I typed in is that I am going to sample things from a normal distribution. So this is going to randomly take things from a normal distribution. That normal distribution has a center of X, which again is our mystery number. I know it's in there. You don't. Um, it has a standard deviation of 20. And I am going to take 16 samples from that distribution. All right, so I'm going to get 16 values from that distribution from that population, and then I'm going to average them together. All right. So this is, again, effectively like me randomly selecting 16 people from a population, taking all their values, averaging them together. And when I do that, I end up with 242.2. Right? So that 242 becomes my point estimator. All right, this is my best guess at the true mean. All right, again, you don't know what the true mean is, but you just sampled from the population. You got this value. So as of right now, that's sort of your best guess of what the true value is. All right. So, we want to now make an interval from that, all right? Instead of just using that one value, we're going to create an interval and say, all right, well, this was our best guess, but the odds of it being exactly right are pretty low. So let's create ourselves an interval above and below. And what we're going to do is we're going to create ourselves a 95% confidence interval. All right. And from that front page, we learned that 95% of the data is plus or minus two standard deviations. So we're going to go plus or minus two standard deviations from the point estimator. Right? And this plus or minus two standard deviations would be our critical value. It's how far we're going above or below the point estimator. All right, so this is our critical value. Now, what's our standard deviation? Well, that's where the formulas from Unit 7 come in. All right, we're dealing with a population here. Um, we have a population standard deviation. When I set it up in the calculator, I told you that the population standard deviation was 16. No, sorry, population standard deviation was 20, and we were taking a sample size of 16. All right, so based on the sampling distribution, all right, so if we wanted to find the standard deviation of our sampling distribution, standard deviation of the sampling distribution 
we're going to use our formula that says it's the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. All right, so again, I told you that the population standard deviation was 20. I told you that I was taking 16 samples from the population. So 20 divided by the square root of 16 is 20 divided by four. So my standard deviation is five. So when I'm making my interval, I'm gonna go two standard deviations up and two standard deviations below, or I'm gonna go 10 above and 10 below. So I'm gonna make an interval that goes up to 252, and I'm gonna make an interval that goes down to 232, right? And this right here is my margin of error. And all together, this whole thing is my confidence interval. All right, so the general process is you sample from the population. From that sample, you calculate your point estimator. All right, then you say, all right, what do I want my confidence level to be? All right, if I want it to be 95%, that means that I have to go two standard deviations above, two standard deviations below. All right, what's my standard deviation? Well, I get that by looking at my formulas. All right, so it's going to depend on what sort of population are you drawing from. Are you drawing from um, like continuous data or quantitative data where you're dealing with means? Then you're going to use this one. Are you dealing with proportions and categorical data? And then you're going to use this one. And that's going to allow us to kind of calculate our margin of error and set up our confidence interval. Now, let's say I did this again. Let's say I took another sample, right? If I took another sample, I wouldn't expect to get the same value, right? And I didn't get the same value. This time I got, let's round that to 239. So if I was to do another one, all right, this one would go from start at 239 and go up to 249 and go down to 229. All right. And then let's say I did it again. All right. This time I got a result of 241. So again, there's my point estimator. I would go up to 251. I would go down to 231. All right. Let's say I did it again. All right. This time I got 237. So my point estimator is over here. And then I would go up to 241. 47, which is about right there. And I would go down to 227, which is about right there. All right. And then let's do a couple more here. So 251, 249. Actually, that's probably 250 when we round it. And 245. So we'll make a point at 251. So that's way up here. We'll make a point at 249. Actually, that's probably just 250. So 250, 251. Sorry, I'm being a little messy here. 250, and then we'll make this one 251. And then we'll make this one 245. And then we'll do one more, 246 and 237. So 246 and 237, all right? And I'm not gonna be totally exact on each of these, but they basically go up two standard deviations. They go down two standard deviations. Again, up, down, and I'm not being exact on these, so don't worry about it right now. Um, but what is the point of doing all these? The point is to say that if we did this over and over and over and over again, all right, 95% of these intervals would contain the true 
population mean. All right, so again, we we don't know what it is, all right? We have no idea what the population mean is. That's what we're trying to find out. So we start by taking a sample, we get our estimate, then based on our confidence level, we go a certain number of standard deviations above or below. The standard deviation is based on our sampling distribution. All right, and that allows us to create this interval. And again, this is just saying, if we were to take all possible samples of size 16, 95% of them would capture the true mean, all right? So the conclusion that we usually write is I'm 95% confident the true mean is between, and then I'm just gonna use this first one here. So the first one we did was 232 and 252, all right? But that's usually the sentence that we will write when creating these is we're so-and-so confident it's between this value and this value. Now, what was the true value? All right, so if I hit X here, the true value was 244, all right? So for us in this little example, the true population parameter was 244, all right? And you'll see, all right, here's 244 right here, all right? all of the intervals we created actually had 244 in it. But if we had done this over and over and over and over again, sooner or later, we would have ended up with an interval that missed, right? Because our sample just happened to get a bunch of really low values, or it happened to get a bunch of really high values. Um, and then our interval would have missed the true value, right? But that's sort of the, the process, that's sort of the thought behind um, these confidence intervals and what we're going to be doing with them, all right? So let's take a look at an example that doesn't involve means and instead involves proportions. Actually, nope, we're not there yet. Hold on. Um, what is the critical values? All right, so on that one, we kind of just used two standard deviations as sort of a rough estimate um, for the critical value. But... It turns out we can be a little more exact than that, all right? And that's what we're gonna do, all right? We're gonna try to be a little more exact with our, our critical values for our confidence intervals. So what is the critical value for a 95% confidence interval? Well, a 95% confidence interval basically says we're looking at 95% of the data, all right? And we're more specifically looking at the center 95% of the data which means that we're leaving 2.5% to the right and we're leaving 2.5% to the left. Now, we have our sort of little rough estimate there that that's about two standard deviations, but it's not exactly two standard deviations, right? If we do an inverse norm of 0.025, all right. We could also do an inverse norm of 0.975. They're going to give us the same absolute value, which is one's going to be positive and one's going to be negative. So distribution menu, inverse norm, 0.025. I'm going to leave those as they are. You'll see that the true value, again, absolute value, so we're ignoring the negative, is like 1.96. So it's not two standard deviations. A more accurate representation is that it's 1.96 standard deviations above and below the mean. Now, we're not always going to create 95% confidence intervals. Sometimes we're going to do 90%. Sometimes we're going to do 99%. Sometimes we're going to do 80%. So how do we go and find the critical values for each of those? Same idea as what we just did up here. All right, so if we want the middle 90%, that means there's 10% left over and 5% is above and 5% is below. So we're gonna do an inverse norm. And again, on this one, you could either do it of 0.05, 0.975, 
or you could do it of 0.95. They're going to give you the same absolute value. So distribution inverse norm 0.05. We get 1.64. And again, these are all standard deviations. So 1.96 standard deviations, 1.64 standard deviations. And these are some of the common values. So eventually we're going to do enough of these that you're just going to remember that, okay, 95% confidence interval is 1.96. 90% confidence interval is 1.64. 99% confidence interval. All right, so if we want 99% of the data, that only leaves 1%, and we have to split that up between the two sides. So it's a half a percent to the right and a half a percent to the left. So I can either put in inverse norm of 0 0.005, or I can put in inverse norm of 0.995. Those will give me the same absolute value. And again, it's just 0.995, 2.58 if we round that up. So 2.58. And then last but not least here, the 80% confidence interval. All right, that leaves 10% on each side. So we can either do an inverse norm of 0 0.10, or we can do an inverse norm of 0.90. All right. So again, inverse norm 0 0.10 is going to give us a negative 1.28, but we're dealing with absolute values here. So 1.28 standard deviations. 2.58 standard deviations. All right, so these are the critical values that we're going to be using most of the time when creating our confidence intervals. Now, in theory, we could use other confidence levels. You could do 97%, you could do 96%, um, but these are some of the more common ones. All right, so I just wanted these to be down here so that you see them because um, it is something that you're going to be doing over and over and over again. So it, it's helpful to just be familiar with um, these four values. Again, nothing ever stops you from doing it on the calculator, but if you get really used to it, um, it can sometimes just make your life easier and be like, okay, 95% confidence interval, 1.96. This is the one that's probably the most common. So if you're gonna remember any of them, um, this is the one that's you're probably gonna use the most. All right, now let's talk about proportions. So. If you were in class, this is the point where I would be walking around and giving you a whole bunch of M&Ms, all right? Because what we're going to do is we're going to try to figure out what proportion of M&Ms are blue. Now, if you're not in school today, um, I will have backup M&Ms, so you can get them when you're in school next time. Um, but that's the activity today. So we're going to we're going to I'm going to give everybody a whole bunch of M&Ms. And we're going to calculate what percent of those M&Ms are blue. And then we're going to use that percentage that we calculate from our sample to um, create a confidence interval, you know, from that data. All right. So in the video, you're just going to have to use your imagination. Um, and then when you're in school, I can give you the M&Ms and you can, you know, live out this, this fantasy in, in real life. Okay, so let's pretend that I give you 50 M&Ms, all right? So your sample size is going to be 50, all right? And let's say you organize your M&Ms and you count it out, and let's pretend you ended up with 11 blue M&Ms, all right? That means that your sample proportion would have been 11 out of 50 or 0.22. Right. 
So that's your sample proportion. And this becomes your point estimator, right? It's what you calculated from your sample. All right, so we could go over here to our graph and we can make a little dot right here at 0.2, which again is coming from that sample proportion. All right, that's our point estimator. It's our best guess of what the true proportion of blue M&Ms are when looking at, you know, all M&Ms produced, you know, globally. All right. Now, the odds of us getting it exactly right are probably pretty low. So we want to give ourselves a margin of error. We want to say, all right, well, you know, um, how far above, how far below do we really want to go? Now, if we're going to do a 95% confidence interval, All right, that's going to give us a critical value of, we just did it, 1.96 standard deviations. All right, so that gives us a critical value of 1.96 standard deviations. All right, now, what is the size of our standard deviation? Well, that's a product of our sampling distribution. And we know we have a formula for that. All right. So if we want to know the standard deviation, all right, we're going to use our P, Q over N. Now, this time we don't know the population P and Q. So we're just going to use the sample P and Q um, and calculate it using our sample values. So for us, that's the square root of 22% times 78% divided by our sample size, which we said was 50. So if I do that, 0.22 times 0.78, divide that by 50, and then take the square root of that. I get a standard deviation of 0.0586. So my interval is going to be 1.96 times this above and 1.96 times this below. All right, so let's do this calculation over here on the side. So here's my point estimate. I've got 0.22. And I want to go above that 1.96 standard deviations. And I know that a standard deviation for this sample size is 0586. 0 0.0586. And I also want to go 1.96 standard deviations below. And again, I know the standard deviation is the 0586. So if I calculate those both out, 0.22 plus 1.96 times 0.0586, uh, 3349, we'll say, 0.3349. And then if we go below, 0.22 minus 1.96 times 0.0586, We've got 01051.1051. Right. So when I'm making my interval here, I can go up to basically 33 and a half, and I can go down to 10 and a half. All right. And again, this right here represents my margin of error. And altogether, this right here represents my confidence interval. All right, my confidence interval is from 0 0.1051 
to 0.3349. All right, and then what we do as a class is everybody does this. So everybody creates their own confidence interval and we see how they line up. So, you know, some people might end up a little higher depending on their exact sample of M&Ms. Some people might end up a little lower depending on what they got, but everybody basically calculates their own confidence interval based on their individual sample of M&Ms that they received. All right. And again, we're trying to estimate, you know, what's the true proportion of blue M&Ms, you know, in the population of M&Ms that exist out there. All right. And again, each one of these is a different interval. We're following the same process. You know, we're following the same process. And if we follow that process over and over and over again, you know, 95% of these intervals should contain the true population parameter, which in our case is basically the percent that are blue. All right, but that's sort of the process and we can do it with proportions using our proportion formulas. We can use it, we can do it with means using our mean formula. All right. The only thing that really changed is, is how you're calculating your standard deviation. Um, turns out that's not exactly true, but we'll get into the more details of this one. There's, there's some extra complications with this one that we'll get into later. But for the most part, the only thing that really changes is um, how you're calculating your standard deviation. Um, you're coming up with the critical values the same way. You know, you're still getting your point estimator. You're still going a certain number of standard deviations above and below that, that point estimator. All right, so, you know, if we were to take all possible samples of size 50, 95 would capture the true mean. All right, this is what our confident, this is what it means to have a confidence level um, to be 95% confident. So, you know, we would say I'm 95% confident the true proportion is between 0 0.1051 and 0 0.1051. Three, three, four, nine. Now, according to the internet, the true proportion of blue um, is 24%. So again, I don't know if that's still the case, but based on what I found on the internet, that's the, uh, that's the true value. So again, you know, most of the intervals did contain that 24%. Um, which is what we would expect, right? You know, one or two might miss, but 95% of them should contain the correct value. Okay. So let's take a look at some just traditional problems so that you can kind of see what these look like and we can go through the process. All right, global warming. If Fox surveyed 900 people and discovered that 50% of the people surveyed believed that global warming existed, Calculate a 95% confidence interval for the true value. All right, so how does this go? So we discovered that 50% of people believed it in our survey. So this 50% becomes our point estimator, right? That's our starting guess for the true value because we have nothing else to go on. Now, to come up with an interval, we need a few things, all right? We need a critical value. All right. And the critical value is based on the size of the confidence interval, all right? So it tells us it's a 95% confidence interval. So that means we're doing an inverse norm of 0.025. All right. Again, that inverse norm is coming from what we talked about back on this page for a 95% confidence interval, 95% eh, confidence interval, there's 5% left over, 
but it's split between the two sides. And that's going to give us the 1.96 that we've been using so far. All right, we need the standard deviation of our sampling distribution. All right, now we don't have the true P and Q, so we're going to use P hat and Q hat over N. So same formula, it's just P hat and Q hat because we don't know the population value. We're just going to use our point estimator as our best guess. So in this case, it's 0.5 times 0.5 divided by 900 people. All right, so this 900 people here is our N or our sample size. And then that we can do on our calculator. So 0.5 times 0.5 divided by 900. And then take the square root of that. Uh, let's see, 0 0.0167. All right. So from this, we can calculate our margin of error. All right, so our margin of error is going to be the 1.96 standard deviations above 1.96 standard deviations above and 1.96 standard deviations below so we've got 1.96 times the 0 0.0167 so 1.96 times 0 0.0167 gives us 0327. We'll go with 0327. 0.0327. All right. So if we want to know our confidence interval, it is going to be the 50% plus or minus our margin of error, which is 0 0.0327, which if we actually work that out, let's see, 0 0.5 minus 0 0.0327 leaves us 0 0.4673 to 0 0.5327, All right? So this would be sort of our final interval there, all right? But we get our point estimator from the problem, all right? We get our critical value by using this 95% confidence interval, all right? That tells us what to put in our inverse norm to get our critical value, all right? The standard deviation, we calculate using our formulas, all right? The margin of error is basically the critical value times your standard deviation. And then we create the confidence interval by going the margin of error above and the margin of error below our point estimator. All right. So interpret the confidence interval in context. All right. We are 95% confident. That the true population parameter. is between 0.4673 and 0.5327. All right, and again, 95% confident means we used a process that 95% of the time will get us an interval that works, all right? Once we have the interval, it's either in there or not, like can't really do anything. We just know that when we start the process, when we start taking our sample and we, we agree to follow this procedure, that 95% of the time, this procedure will get us an interval that contains the true value. All right. So 
Same problem here, only now we're looking at a 90% confidence interval. All right, so let's think about what actually changes when we switch from 95% to 90%. So critical value. When we switch to 90%, we're no longer doing an inverse norm of 0.025. We'd now be doing an inverse norm of 5%. Now, again, where's that 5% coming from? Well, if it's the middle 90%, there's 10% left over, and that 10% gets split between the left and the right. So this is informing what we're doing here. All right. Now, again, inverse norm of 0.05 is technically going to give me a negative number, but we're going to ignore the negative and just use 1.64. Now, the standard deviation is based on P, Q, and N. P is the same, which means Q is the same, N is the same, so this hasn't changed. It's the same 0.0167 from up above, All right? That part is exactly the same. Now the margin of error uses the critical value. So that has changed, right? Because we have a new critical value. So instead we're gonna be doing 1.64 times 0.0167, right? 1.64 times 0.0167 for, we'll say 0 0.0274. And then because our margin of error has changed, our confidence interval has also changed. So confidence interval is now going to be 0 0.5. Our point estimator hasn't changed. That's still the same. Plus or minus 0 0.0274, which means what's 0 0.5 minus 0 0.0274? Uh, 0 0.4726 to 0 0.5274. All right. So that would be our 90% confidence interval. So interpret the confidence interval in context. Again, this is just the sentence we want to get used to writing, but we are 90% confident that the true population parameter is between 0.4726 uh, and 0.5274. So some thought questions down below here. All right, what's good about changing from 95% confidence to 90% confidence? So if we compare these two intervals, what's the main difference? All right, on the 90% confidence interval, these values are closer together. Our intervals become shortened. All right, so your interval size gets smaller, right? Which is good. You know, if you give people too much of a range, they're gonna be like, all right, what use is that? Like if I say, oh, your, your true population value is somewhere between 0% and 100%. I'm not wrong, but I didn't really give you any valuable information. Um, when I go from 95 to 90% confidence, the interval gets smaller, which is like, all right, good. I, I, there's less uncertainty here. I've got, you know, a better idea that it's between these two values. Um, the flip side of that is what's bad about changing from 95% confidence to 90% confidence. Um, there's a higher chance
that your interval doesn't actually contain the true population value. All right. And instinctually, this kind of makes sense, all right? If you make your interval smaller, there's a higher chance that you're not actually going to get the true value. If you make your interval larger, there's a better chance that you're going to get the true value because you're giving yourself more wiggle room, all right? And that's what I was trying to show in that very first kind of demo that I put up when we were taking down our definitions. All right, so now that we have a little better understanding of what's happening here, all right, let's say I leave the sample size at 25, all right? When I take a sample of 25 and I only have an 80% confidence, all right, my interval is this large, all right? If I wanna be 99% confident, you can see that line slowly growing because to be 99% confident, I have to increase the size of my interval, all right? So there's this push and pull here of, if you want a higher confidence level, then you have to have a bigger interval. If you want a smaller confidence level, um, if you want a smaller interval, then you have to have a lower confidence level. Now, the way around that is, you know, to increase your sample size. So if I take a really large sample, if I, you know, set my sample at 250, um, then I can get a pretty small interval, even when I have a really high level of confidence. Now, why does the interval get small? Right? It goes back to our formulas, right? When that population gets, when the sample size gets really large and we're using our PQ over N, that makes the standard deviation really small. So two standard deviations when you're talking about a sample size of 250 is going to be a lot smaller than two standard deviations when you're talking about a sample size of 10, right? And again, it all comes back to this kind of sampling distribution um, and those formulas and everything that we talked about in unit seven. You know, as our sample size gets bigger, um, there's more, there's less variability with our sample results, um, which is going to allow us to create a smaller interval. Um, when the sample size is smaller, there's more variability, which is going to result in us having to create a much larger interval um, to be, you know, 90% confident that we're still getting the true value or 99% confident or what have you, All right? But hopefully this makes a little more sense now that we've kind of run through the calculations and you've seen how everything sort of fits together. So as an actual researcher out in the field, you have sort of this, you know, push and pull of, okay, I need my interval to be only so large, but if I only, if I want it that large, you know, what can I set the confidence level at? But what sample can I actually afford to collect? Um, that's like the big thing is usually money is the limiting factor. You know, it's easy to say, take a large sample as you want, um, but there's usually money behind these things. So um, there's sort of this push and pull of like, well, we can only afford to sample 100 people. So what can we set the confidence level at? What level of risk are we willing to accept? Um, and you start moving these values around and, and kind of running through different scenarios based on the nature of your research and how important it is um, that your interval does contain the true value. All right. So again, this is what we're going to be looking at for the next couple of classes. Um, there's some, you know, different things that we have to worry about um, when we're sampling for means that we didn't talk about today. Um, we're going to work, talk about like how to calculate, you know, different sample sizes to get results that you want. Um, but that's the general direction that we're going in um, for the next few classes. All right. If you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, have a great day and I will see you when I see you.